Finally. We're here. Finally watching this video. Tarnished Archaeologist, Godfrey and Sirach. Let's, uh, let's do it. Or something. Hello, everyone. Today's episode will be a bit different from our usual style. Okay. This is more of a podcast format with some visual support, but much less produced to That's explore okay. some of the topics that didn't fit into the last episode on Godfrey and the Fortified Manor. We'll return as soon as we can with part two of that analysis. But for now, please enjoy this mini podcast style episode okay. where we explore the role of Sirach in the story of Godfrey. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to learn more about Sirach, specifically. Myths and legend are powerful, unifying stories, as we've seen in our last episode, capable of inspiring and motivating when wielded by adept rulers. But they aren't just that. They often reflect real-world events and political circumstances, however faint and distorted by the lens of time. The creation myths contained within the Kojiki, for example, which are probably the oldest extant writing of any kind from Japan, recorded in the 8th century of the Common Era, but likely reflecting oral tradition centuries earlier, are good examples of this. They begin with the story of the creator gods, Izanagi and Izanami, and their creation of the associated pantheon, as well as the Japanese archipelago itself. One of the cool. most famous stories within the Kojiki is the legend of two of these divine children, the sun goddess Amaterasu and her brother, the wind or storm god Susanuo. The legend goes like this. One day, Susanuo destroys a bunch of his sister Amaterasu's stuff. Oh. She becomes so enraged that she runs and hides in a cave called Imano Owato, a cave which is still considered sacred to this day. That's cool. Amaterasu's hiding causes the entire world to be without a son, which of course causes panic among the rest of the gods. Eventually, they lure her out of the cave by tricking her with a mirror, as she is so entranced and jealous at the light that she sees in the mirror that she assumes another sun goddess has taken her place. Oh. After luring her out, the other gods banish Susanoo from the realm of the gods to the earthly plane of Japan. Though this is a punishment, once on earth, Susanoo slays a local dragon and is revered as a hero later warding off disease and helping crop growth for the locals. Interesting. Although he has clearly been subordinated to Amaterasu, he continues to be worshipped to this day in Shinto shrines in Japan, most famously the Suza Shrine in Izumo, modern-day Shimane. I want to go to Japan so badly to see all these temples. There are so many temples, but like... There's such amazing architecture over there, and some of it has been there for so long. And a lot of these were built without nails, too, which is really interesting to think about. I've seen a lot of videos of, uh, like, showing really neat buildings like this built just completely without nails, just using the wood in certain ways so that it, like, interlocks and it doesn't come apart. Oh, God, I need to play Sekiro so bad. <laughs> The most common reading of this story is as a political allegory for the late Yayoi period. Effectively, it reflects the real historical events wow. as it tells the story of how the Izumo clan, who worshipped the storm god, Susanoo, became subordinate to the clan that worshipped the sun goddess, Amaterasu, called the Yamato clan. This is a story with a clear political purpose to legitimize the rule of the Yamato and to establish the ruling right of their descendants of Amaterasu. <clears throat> Japanese emperors still claim descent to this day from Amaterasu. That's crazy. And so it is like, critical cool. to the story that the storm god Susanoo, the one who nominally loses the struggle and is banished, is still made out to be a hero in the end, slaying hmm. the dragon and saving the villagers. The story simultaneously legitimizes Yamato rule while allowing the Izumo clan, which is subordinated, to be heroic and proud. It is the legendary reflection of a real-world political compromise. 
the Izumo agreeing to allow the Emperors to descend from the Yamoto clan, who they are subordinated to, while also preserving the role of the Izumo in the story. The point of going on this introductory tangent is to make the point that legends, while of course distorted, adapted, and evolved over time, often reflect a kernel of history, and in yeah. particular, often lend legendary drama to perhaps otherwise mundane political events. True. So it is, of course, with Elden Ring. Last time we discussed the legend of Lord Godfrey, clearly drawn from real-world Arthurian legend, attempting to peer behind the curtain of this myth to glimpse his origin story, using, as always, forensic archaeology as our guide. This time, we introduce a key player in that story, that of Godfrey's erstwhile enemy turned aged advisor, Sirach. The legend of Godfrey design. and Sirach, that the former Lord of Beasts, East Sirach, was taken on as an aged counselor to the eventual Elden Lord, is exactly the sort of political fable that is told to legitimize the ruling right <clears throat> of the victor and his lineage, that is, Godfrey and the Golden Lineage, while also preserving the honor of the defeated. Yeah. Just like the tale of Susanoo and Amaterasu, which reflects real-world political compromise and events, the legend of Godfrey and Sirach joining forces, so to speak, at the outset of his reign as Elden Lord, is highly interpretable. Last episode, we analyzed the fortified manor, deducing that it was, in fact, of an earlier era than the rest of Lane Dell, oh. and letting the round table itself tell the story of Godfrey's origins. Today, we introduce Sirach's role into that story, and the legend told which reflects this early history. Key to our analysis last time was the notion that, while banners, paintings, sometimes even statues, may be replaced or moved, architecture may tell a deeper story. And while we believe this is correct in methodology, we did deliberately ignore one element of the fortified manor, the carved emblem of the golden lineage, Sirach, on the arcade of the manor. At first glance, this seems like a contradiction. After all, we said that the manor was built during the Saint and Great Tree Stratum, before the peak of Landell, and yet here is an emblem of the Golden Lineage carved into its walls, seemingly of the original stratum. The resolution to that apparent contradiction, and the thesis of this video, is that at the time the manor was built, it was not an emblem of the Golden Lineage but rather an emblem of the lord of this manor, Sirach, whose role in this story is much more significant than it may initially seem. Evidence for this comes in many somewhat circumstantial but overall convincing forms. First, we have the description of Sirach himself, who is said to be a, quote, lord of beasts who went on to become King Godfrey's regent. Makes sense. End quote by the Beast Claw Hammer description. That's a cool hammer, by the way. This pretty clearly states that before he was Godfrey's regent, he was already a lord, who subsequently became Godfrey's regent and advisor. Sirach. In that would be a really, really cool poster to have. I guess they got a hit up displayed or something. Oh yeah, eh, Bridges? Yeah, it's there both his artistic depictions in Stormvale, as well as in the boss fight cutscene, is depicted wearing a crown, likely meaning that this title of Lord was not merely honorific, but that Sirach truly was a ruler of some kind. The Beast Claw Greathammer is gifted by Garank, aka Malaketh, yeah. and its description also makes reference to Sirach's five claws. If you've seen our Furumazula video, then you will know that this is clearly a reference to Sirach's intelligence, as the five fingers are said by the Cinquedea description to represent the intelligence once granted upon the beasts. So, oh. short sword given high ranking, encouraging design celebrates the five beasts' five fingers, symbolic of the intelligence once granted upon their kind. <sighs> So does that mean? <gasps> does that mean the two and the three fingers are dumb? If five fingers is intelligence? I'm just saying, maybe it wasn't such a bad idea to piss off the fingers. If, you know. 
Chapel, Sirash was a noble, intelligent Lord of Beasts, likely connected to pre-destruction for Rumazula, though we'll leave the full ramifications of that connection for another episode. With that partial view of Sirash's backstory in mind, let's now return to the forensics. Godfrey's Elden Throne Room in Stormvale Castle bears the unmistakable marks of iconographic replacement, as we will discuss in much greater detail in the next episode, cool. but it bears some mentioning here. The Crucible statues seem to be... You lost me. Was this about the five-finger thing in two... Bridges, it's a joke. There's a blade uh, here that says that his five fingers represented his intelligence. So I was just making a joke that the two fingers and the three fingers were dumb. That's all. Nothing serious. There's a lore video where it's posited that the two fingers and the three fingers were once part of a whole hand? That makes sense! Then the hand got mad at itself and then... The three that fucked off were like, burn it all down. <laughs> yeah. The giant skull. Yeah, right? Godfrey's Elden Throne Room in Stormvale Castle bears the unmistakable marks of iconographic replacement, as we will discuss in much greater detail in the next episode but it bears some mentioning here. The crucible statues seem to be later additions in front of pre-existing bronzes, showing an older libation ritual. Likewise, the bronze relief in the throne room of Sirash almost appears to predate the statue of Godfrey, which is placed in front. And of course, the Elden Throne itself, by definition a later addition since Stormvale was built before Godfrey became Elden Lord, is actually covering an emblem on the floor. What is odd about that is that the emblem appears to be that of the Golden Lineage, in other words, of Sirush. How could this be unless, somehow, the beast emblem predates Godfrey? That's cool as hell. As we know, Sirush was actually a lord prior to becoming Godfrey's advisor and regent. What was he a lord of, though? Well, the shit that people notice when they stop and look at every single ounce of detail in every single game. The amount of observational skills that some of these people have are incredible. I am so imp I would have never noticed that. Ne I would have never noticed that. Maybe hazy. You know, it's true, though, because with the three fingers, like, they, they go around you like this. They have one in front. That makes a lot of sense. They don't go around like this, but like this. I think we're on to something. That alone could be an entire DLC. <laughs> Godfrey's advisor and regent. What was he a lord of, though? Well, we would propose, based on the evidence at hand, he was a lord of beasts, ruling from the fortified manor in Dell, and played a key role in ruling Stormvale prior to Godfrey's ascent. And Stormvale is of the same stratum as the fortified manor, hence why we see his visage carved into the fortified manor, a yep. building older than the rest of Dell, and on the manor tower shield. Oh, cool. If it seems odd that a beast like Sirash would be Lord of Hawks, or at least Lord of the Stormhawks, consider that we see exactly this combination of hawks and beasts in Ferumazula, so this ancient alliance between beasts and hawks is not so implausible. Furthermore, as pointed out by last protagonist, while the description of Banished Knight Engvall's and Oleg's ashes call them, in the English script at least, quote, wings of the storm, end quote, I should. the Japanese script is much more explicit in linking them to the Storm Lord, as they are called, quote, wings of the Storm Lord, end quote. Check out oh. his video on the topic for more context, 
but for our purposes, this fits quite nicely with the idea that the Lord of Stormvale and Fortified Manor, who was the Storm Lord, commanded the Legion now yeah. known as the Banished Knights. This would go a long way towards explaining why their armor is found in such density and reverential position in the Fortified Manor and Stormvale. These knights were the knights of the Stormlord, likely who is depicted on their helm, and who clearly had close ties with Sirash. As to why they would eventually become known as the Banished Knights, and whether Sirash was in fact the Stormlord, these questions will have to wait for a future episode. But we'll just add here that the relationship between Sirash, Lord of the Fortified Manor, and the Stormlord, who is likely the dragon depicted on the Banished Night Helm, nicely parallels the ancient relationship between dragon lords and their beastmen attendants, <clears throat> which goes all the way back to the time of Furumazula. It's pretty cool. Now, remember that the round table found inside the fortified manor symbolizes Godfrey, with his bronze axe now embedded in the table, <clears throat> giving up his barbarian ways and agreeing to become Elden Lord. It is said that it was precisely this moment that he took Sirash on as regent and advisor. So, what weapon did he exchange his prior bronze axe for? Well, Godfrey's axe, of course. Makes sense. Which is said to symbolize his vow to conduct himself as a lord. And where did he get this new axe from? Well, from his defeated foe, Sirash. Oh! Credit to Reddit user Kurinai Jack for pointing out that Godfrey's axe shares striking similarity to the Beastman's cleaver. We agree with this analysis. The engravings and the material are highly similar. Their shared shape even seems to suggest that the yeah. cleaver was made from what was once an axe, or perhaps vice versa. The oh. simple wooden shaft... And that is so true. Look at that. Huh the iron used to produce the blade are identical. Yep. The subtle differences between the two weapons that the developers apparently went through the trouble of actually designing, namely the slightly more ornate pattern on Godfrey's axe, <clears throat> suggest that while they higher undoubtedly status. come from the same culture, the axe is the weapon of higher status, while the Called cleaver it. is likely the basic infantryman weapon. Quite consistent with what we already know about the current beastmen of Furumazula. Yeah. Oof, All of this suggests that Godfrey's axe, before it was a symbol of him as Elden Lord, was actually a regal beast's weapon. And more specifically, it was Sirash's. Oof. There That's is gotta precedent sting a little. for defeated foes becoming trusted allies and advisors from both real history and legend. And sure enough, King Arthur's legend is informative once again. One of Arthur's... No, it doesn't. I don't actually know where the other part of his weapon is. However, when you fight his, like, past form, his weapon is complete. So I'm not entirely sure where the other half of his weapon is. Or what happened to it. We'd have to... That's another thing. Is, I wonder if he's going to bring up what happened to his arcs, because it used to be complete, and we can see that in the game, but it's broken when you actually fight the real him. Closest knights in the round table, Galahad, begins his yeah. story as an enemy of Arthur, who then joins the round table after being awestruck by the battle prowess of one of Arthur's knights, who turns out to be Lancelot. Though the story comparison is admittedly somewhat loose, it's worth mentioning that Galahad's crest is a dead ringer for the beast crest, suggesting the inspiration may be real. Though, to be fair, lion crests are quite common in medieval heraldry. Incredibly common, yeah. Regardless, the overall story arc seems pretty clear. Godfrey defeated Sirash in battle, after which Sirash became... What if he stole this from Sirash during the fight and that's where he got this scar? What if he stole this axe from Sirash, embedded this into Sirash's head, and it broke while he was taking it out? And that's why he's a spectral form of Sirash and not really like a physical form. Pretty sure he was like a specter, like a spirit. This, uh, 
This this doesn't look so healthy for his uh, life. When you find a corrupt string. You kind of know they had some stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's- it's- it's plausible. I don't mean- I, I'm just totally spitballing here, you know? Crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lion- lions are a massive symbol of power and status. Absolutely. They're very regal-looking animals. Makes sense to me. Came Godfrey's advisor. This is a story arc that actually FromSoft have used before, with Sekiro's Gyobo the Demon becoming Genichiro Ashina's most trusted retainer, only yeah. after his defeat at the hands of the Ashina. If you accept our conclusions to this point, it begs the question, why does an axe of Sarash become the symbol of Godfrey's line, the Golden Lineage? Well, once again, real-world history can help give context to this. It is extremely common, actually, for a king to seek legitimacy by claiming descent, or lineage, or cultural heritage at least, from a more powerful ancient ruler. Yeah. And often this is done through the deliberate use of ancient cultural symbols. Yeah. History is actually rife with such examples. Think of Charlemagne negotiating with Pope Leo to be crowned Roman Emperor, the first Roman Emperor in more than 300 years since the fall of the Western Empire. But to stay on theme, let's look at how history and legend intersect once again in the tale of King Arthur and King Edward I. Edward I, who lived in the late 13th to early 14th century, was a Norman king, actually of the same Norman line that built all those castles we discussed That's last cool. episode as inspirations for Stormvale and the Fortified Manor. Indeed, Edward himself famously built many of those castles in Wales. You may know him as Longshanks, the villain in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, but his story is much more interesting than that. As a Norman, that is to say, Braveheart. a French-speaking descendant of the Vikings that had invaded the Frankish kingdoms a few centuries earlier, he is effectively an outsider and part of a ruling minority. The Normans were notoriously brutal in their regime of elite replacement and subsequent repression of the local Anglo-Saxons. French was the only language to be spoken in official discussion and used in official documents, and native Anglo-Saxons, that is to say, English speakers, were by and large not permitted to be involved in high-level politics <laughs> or hold high office. <laughs> Take but that. Edward, like Us. all great rulers, knew that some way to engender local support was necessary for effective rule and to avoid the civil strife oh, that, that had cool. plagued his father's rule. This was especially true in Wales, which Edward ended up conquering and unifying with England. And for this, he turned to the power of Arthur's legend. Remember from last time that Arthur, if he lived at all, lived in the 5th or 6th century AD, several hundred years before Edward, mm -hmm. and was a local Romano-Briton who fought against the invasions of the Anglo-Saxons. He appears first in the historical record in several Welsh poems as a mighty warrior, then, the story as we know it today first appears several centuries later in Geoffrey of Monmouth's pseudo-historical document, The History of the Kings of Britain. So do we not really actually know if he was real or not? It's a shame that we don't have a lot, or like significantly more um, written history. I feel like everything should be archived. We don't even know if he was re really. Yeah, I don't know. Crazy. That's cool though. Man, that that is that's true though. It's it's hard to know what actually happened. It is it's hard to know what actually happened in the past. Especially, especially when it comes to, like, wars and stuff. Because, you know, history is written by those who win. And they can write anything that they want. Or, like, when, uh, when the Great Library of Alexandria was burned, you know, and they lost all those books. 
Could you imagine if that was still a thing? If it didn't get burnt? Like, what knowledge was lost? Alexander. There were some rulers that were determined to wipe conquered civilizations conquered civilizations from history exactly history is written by those who win it's in the vatican basement the vatican has a lot of stuff hidden in it have to do some mighty deeds and live long enough to tell them to be remembered yep history is written by the winter library of alexandria yeah craziness Oh man, that's nuts. History is so fascinating, but at the same time, it's like it's hard to know what actually happened. And even then, a lot of different people will have different opinions on what has happened. So it's hard to know what's real and what's not. Because And also, people will just say shit. People will just say shit without actually knowing, or they will have learned something from someone else and just take it as fact. That's, but that's just human. That's just human shit right there. I'm sure I've said a lot of things that are wrong. It just happens. Take everything everyone says with a grain of salt. During his rule, Edward deliberately modeled himself off of Arthur in order to gain legitimacy. When he conquered the Welsh, Edward staged a coronation ceremony with a crown he claimed had been worn by Arthur himself. On Easter Day, 1278, he staged an elaborate ceremony for the opening and reinterment of the remains of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. Not their actual remains, mind you, but remains that had been conveniently, quote, found by monks at the site. With these two ceremonies, Edward seemed to at once be confirming the death of Arthur, in fact, he left the supposed skull of Arthur exposed on display and claiming effective descent from Arthur himself and authority to rule the area. Subsequently, he staged jousting festivals known as Round Tables at Winchester, which he said to be the site of Arthur's seat. And at Winchester Castle, he, or perhaps his son, even commissioned the construction of a literal round table, still viewable to this day. That's so cool. To solidify the point. Edward adeptly wielded the power of Arthur's legend to claim legitimacy of rule of the Anglo-Saxons. His successors, of course, including Normans and the subsequent Plantagenets, would do much of the same, clinging to the legend as a source of legitimacy for a ruling minority. So, in this light, it is not so surprising, then, that Godfrey would use his relationship with Sirach, the Lord of Beasts of a much more ancient ruling line tied to Furumazula, to help legitimize his claim to rule. Nor is it surprising that his descendants, the Golden Lineage, would in turn also venerate the image of Sirach as a symbol of their line, as it symbolizes their connection to this ancient culture and ruling dynasty. And so now finally, we will briefly turn to Godric, the so-called dregs of the Golden Lineage, who is so desperate to impress and claim power from his predecessors. In this new light, it is understandable that Godric would fashion a weapon, a new golden axe, which, like Edward's round table, clearly is made much later in an effort to deliberately draw from the totemic power of Godfrey's axe. He still ended and up being a big pussy, though. in an though. extremely clever bit of storytelling and characterization, Godric's axe reproduces only the superficial features of Godfrey's weapon. Yep while reproducing none of the characteristic designs or material usage. What was an iron weapon with a wooden shaft and bestial engravings is now an ostentatious golden axe meant to evoke the glory of the golden lineage. Yeah. This weapon says quite a Pompous. bit about Godric, that he is so desperate to claim descent from a once great lineage, but that he ultimately knows nothing of its true origins. Idiot. So, to summarize what we've learned thus far, we would propose that Sirach was the lord of the fortified manor and played a key role in ruling Stormvale prior to Godfrey. Godfrey defeated him, perhaps in single combat, what is alluded to in Godfrey's armor set, 
and likely the origin story of that scar which runs across Sarash's face and divides his crown. Oof. When he won, Godfrey forged a new alliance with his vanquished foe. Sarash offered his service and his axe to Godfrey. Okay. Godfrey exchanged his old bronze axe, the one that had okay. scarred Sarash, for a new weapon All symbolizing right. his new rule and his new connection to the ancient rulers of Furumazula, much like Edward crowning himself with the supposed crown of Arthur. But what happened to the other half of his axe? Well, that concludes our analysis of the legend and history of Godfrey and Sarash. Like the story of Susanoo and Amaterasu, it reflects a real-life political compromise mm -hmm. that also served to legitimize the monarchical lineage. Join us next time when we resume our standard style of video to explore the story of Mary. I thought this was a, a well put together the time video. Of the Crucible before the age of the Erd Tree. I thought there was an awful lot of good information in there. I mean, I didn't know anything about Sirach, so that's really cool. Now I just. I, the one main question that I have. Um, is what happened to his axe? Where are Millennia and Michaela's? Well, Michaela would only be considered an Empyrean as a woman. That's the thing, because only only women are Empyreans. So Melania, yeah, sure, she could be considered an Empyrean. But Michaela would only be considered an Empyrean if he did evolve and like take the form of Saint Trina, then potentially could be considered an Empyrean. Why are there two different axes? Well, Godfrey had an axe. He used it to fight Sirash, and then he gave up that axe to become the Elden Lord, and then had uh, Sirash's axe, and claimed it as his own, uh, and then what's the other guy's name? Godric? He made himself an axe out of gold to um, be a pompous little cunt. Yeah, yeah, it's basically just like a like a fan, yeah, a fan made prop. Why did he have to give up his axe? Um, I think it really was just because he wanted to absorb the. Um, status of Sirash, like he explained in the video. Absorbing a relic of another time that was very powerful. And it also just sort of... Yeah, replica. There you go. There's the word I was thinking of. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's pretty much it. But yeah, Michaela, um Natural Michaela uh, couldn't be an Empyrean. So, there's that. It would be really cool to see St. Trina arise, though. That would be very cool. And again, what if Michaela is betraying Melania to become Empyrean and then become the new leader of the world and take on a lord for themselves. Although I kind of doubt it, because I feel like Michaela really truly did love Melania, even though Melania does, like Melania that we know uh, her as, did kind of die from letting the rot overtake, like, Melania as her original mental self, you know, like she becomes like the god of rot, right? Or goddess of rot. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's kind of true. America is the number one character I want to see. Yeah, I mean, I guess we would have to see how that goes. I mean, when you when you beat the game, I mean, you do kind of well, you put her head back on, right? I don't know what happens after that. You put her head back on. I don't know. I don't really know what to make of that. I'm gonna have to have that, like, ending explained. Like, is- is- is Merica and Radagon- like, are they dead? Or... 
like what happens there like yeah okay you kill the elden beast and then you put the head back on the body and then your lord i want to see the blind swordsman as well i think that'd be really cool Reminds me of playing Oblivion, stealing a replica of any sword, and wondering why I did shit damage and why I did make it. Oh. Man. Unfounded theory that Merica knows she and Radagon are the same, but Radagon didn't. Well, yeah, Merica um, talks about it, doesn't she? in like a quote in, in like a an item description or something i i could believe that i could totally believe that i mean radagon goes off does his thing meets ranala has kids and then is forced to return and become a part of america all these corpses of the demigods are they alive i guess yeah it's yeah it's 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 unfortunate i mean the only one i mean even then um like, Ronnie died in body, but not in soul. You know? So, like, is that even really, like, a, a death? Is that even a true death? Same with, um... Oh, I, can, I, can, I can... I always get thrown off by all the names, even though I've watched all these videos. Who dies in, 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 in uh, spirit, but not in body? I don't know. Like, are they truly dead? Because only one part of them is dead. I don't know, man. Ugh. Ugh. There's so much to think about. I feel, yeah, I know. I feel like I should know more. But the, here's the thing. Is that almost all the videos we're watching is pretty much just pieced together by item descriptions and speculation. There is a lot that we don't know. And a lot of this is really just people putting words together and then filling in the gaps. We, we might be wrong about a lot of things. We don't even know the true motivation. F yeah, Godwin, thank you. We don't even know the true motivation for Ronnie to, uh, like, kind of kill herself and Godwin. Like, you can... You can try and put two and two together, but, you know... So both only half dead. Yeah, that's crazy. America, Melania, Michaela, M Melena. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> she didn't want to be the next Elden Lord. Well, she wouldn't be. She's an Empyrean, so. She wouldn't be the next Elden Lord, but she would be the Empyrean, which would have to be brought together with a Lord. Which people were suspecting that she potentially was to be wed to, um, to God Godwin, was it? So she potentially had Godwin killed so that she wouldn't have to do that. That's what some people are thinking. You can try and put two and two together, but if you get four, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Millicent, yeah, well, Mi Millicent, um, Millicent is sort of like a, God, what was the word they used? Oh, what was the word they used? They said, like, buds or something? The four, like, daughters of Melania? But they weren't technically daughters? What were, hmm. There is so much going on. <laughs> yeah, there's there, it's true. There's a lot of very, very important characters to start with them. Like clones, kind of, yeah. 
I don't know, but she's a descendant from Melania. What was the word? Yeah, it was like like buds or something. Valkyries it was another thing I heard, yeah. I think they had oh, they had to like evolve into Valkyries or something. Kinda like how Melania became the goddess of rot. But then in that video when we were talking, um, they don't even think that that was the third bloom. They think that that was the second bloom when we fight her. So she might not have even actually been like a god yet. He evolved into Valkyries, but he don't know Jack. He might not know everything. That's true. Gowrie might not know everything. Who knows? And it's not like these games are particularly good at just spelling it all out for you. I can't wait for the DLC. I hope there's more than one DLC. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting though. I love Elden Ring. It's so good. It's so, so good. They're particularly good at not spell it's true. People were thinking that Gowrie was an outer god of rot. Maybe. Who knows? Who the fuck knows? I don't know. He's just some dude sitting in a chair in some broken down house outside of Celia. I don't remember where I heard the joke, but it's well right. Let players fill in the rest. Yeah, we'll write enough stuff. It's true. It's true. I mean, and you know what? It seems like the the player base has done a very good job of that. Yeah, or the joke where um where like the creator uh will say well he, he like he watches lore videos, he's like, Oh, so that's how it all comes together. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. That's so funny. I like that. I don't know. I feel like it's a very fun way to get the uh, audience involved with your game and to really let them enjoy it. Making people think about stuff and letting them speculate and fill in their own gaps, I think, is a great way to get uh, to get it out there. Because people will make these crazy awesome videos like the prepare to cries and whatnot. And like that is just so much fun to watch. And it just makes me want to play the game even more. It's, it's good advertising to not fill in all the gaps because other people will do it for you and they want everyone to see it. A mouthpiece. Yeah. Like the mouth of Sauron in a way. Yeah. People are making it their full-time career to make these all- It's so true, Bridges! It's so true! It's so true, and now I'm spending literally half of my streams just learning about it and uploading that. It's a- it's a cycle. Not that I'm making any money off of any of this, I'm just having fun and hoping that you guys also support the creators that we watch. The puppet and outer god speaks through. Yeah, exactly. Very well could be. Very well could be. I wonder if any of the DLCs will go into more information about the outer gods or if they're going to keep it purposefully am ambiguous. I feel like they should actually kind of leave the outer gods out of it. Um, like one thing that I think World of Warcraft did wrong was delve a little bit too much into the gods. Like, when they started trying to hint at, like, giving Elune more of, like, a... I don't know, they made Elune seem a lot less ambiguous. And when they started, like, talking about, like, other... Like, what... God, how do I even say this? When they started involving the gods physically in the game or alluding that you might get a chance to actually meet them, I feel like that made the game worse. Well, yeah, they just got him to write the history 
They didn't get him to write the game itself. They just asked him to write the history, and then they made a game based off of it. They took the Cthulhu mythos and made it way too overt. You're so right. You are so right. Oh. I, f I feel like... And it doesn't always have to be like this, but it has to be done in a very... Like... It has to be done well. If you are going to physically inject gods that are supposed to be mysterious into something it usually is not going to end up turning out good. Like, I hope that World of Warcraft leaves a loon alone, but I feel like they're not going to do that. They just need to go to space already to fight the Zerg, the Protoss, and the Terran. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, how cool would it be if, um, if the Warcraft universe was in the same universe as, uh, as Starcraft and they had, like, a little crossover... I mean, it would piss me off, but at the same time, I would probably, like, I would still play it, whatever it was. Yeah, well, Cthun, that's the thing. Uh, that's a whole other But then, like, when you make them a physical entity that you can fight and kill, it just, I don't know. I don't, I don't usually like that. Battle for Azeroth. Um... Yeah, uh, I know who you're talking about. I remember the, like, 2D cinematic for showing him when Ashara gets dragged down into the depths. Is that the one you're talking about? The one that was like a giant tree? Oh, a giant tree? I liked how the gods appeared in the Vikings series. It will always... Yeah, I liked that too. I liked that too. It was always like a fever dream whenever the gods made their appearance. Which I'm okay with, but... That's also a show. It's, it's a little different than like a game, I guess. The one that was like a giant tree... I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like it's really hard to write gods into anything. <laughs> yeah, we're just... <laughs> the one from the Emerald Nightmare. Oh, I don't remember that one. I didn't... I wasn't playing World of Warcraft at the time. I was just watching all the cinematics because I'm a cinematics person. I love watching cinematics. Konichi, what's up? <laughs> oh, don't mind my name. It was a joke. A bad. Oh, that's fine. You've got a fantastic name. It's, it's beautiful. It was in Legion. Yeah, I never played Legion. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I, uh... <sighs> I don't know. See, I played World of Warcraft when it came out. Bef like, when it came out. Before Burning Crusade and all that. And then I actually moved somewhere without internet just before Burning Crusade. And then started playing again during Cataclysm. Oh. Oh, God. It was a bad time. It was a bad time, man. <sighs> Going from playing vanilla to playing Cataclysm, I felt like my child had been ripped out of my arms. The game was so different. Oh man, I don't remember that at all, Locke. Yeah, I'm old as shit. 17 days and I will be old as hell. In woman years, yeah. Yeah, man. Damn, fuck. <laughs>